guys, welcome back to Hachimama TV. Today we're going to be talking about the Hindenburg disaster and some conspiracies in the history around the disaster. I think we're all familiar with some of the images of the giant blimp that is engulfed in flames, but I've learned a lot about the Hindenburg and its cause and a bunch of mysteries that still exist around what happened on that day and how many people believe that the Hindenburg was actually, the Hindenburg disaster was actually an act of sabotage. So let's go ahead and get into it. And today we're talking about the Hindenburg disaster. So let's roll the intro. History of airships. So if you're anything like me when I was little and I saw pictures of the Hindenburg, I definitely just assumed it was like a disaster waiting to happen and that these airships were completely unsafe and probably not used very often, which is, all that is partially true. But I was surprised to learn that airships actually have like a pretty rich history and they were first invented in the 17th century, and they were used pretty much up until the Hindenburg disaster, which happened in 1937. So that's a long time of people using airships that is kind of unaccounted for in my mind. <laughs> but they were first invented in France, and the concept was started off kind of with like hot air balloons. Like that was the first kind of like airship. So they were invented in France, and then it wasn't until 1895 that the first rigid airship, which is now called a Zeppelin, was invented in Germany. So they went around 25 miles per hour, or 42 kilometers per hour, if any of you are not from America. And they were used in a lot of like military things by Germany in World War One. It was considered like this great military advantage to have these airships, which to me, it seems like a giant like bomb waiting to explode on yourself, but I guess it worked because they were used for a long time. And back in these days, people were really looking for a fast way to travel across continents because if you went by boat, it could take up to a week and it was uncomfortable and people just wanted to get there faster, but airplanes couldn't fly above weather systems so you couldn't fly an airplane long distances because you really had to depend on weather. They hadn't invented depressurization technology. So if there was ever any storms, you were not safe in an airplane and that just wasn't good for long distances. You could maybe just go as far as you could tell the weather, but would not work going cross continents. So during the 1930s and 1920s, Britain, Germany, and the United States focused on developing these really large, rigid, passenger-carrying airships, which they're called airships because they're as big as ships, like they were huge. Some were 13 stories tall. I think that was actually the Hindenburg where I heard that. Um, and unlike Britain and Germany, the United States focused primarily on helium to have their airships um, float, but other countries didn't have the resource of helium or yeah helium that the united states did so they had to rely on hydrogen which is extremely flammable and since the united states had the bulk of the helium in the united states they didn't really want to like let people have it and they were stingy about it so helium was able to be made but found in natural gas deposits in the United States and it wasn't flammable like hydrogen, but the United States felt like they only had small quantities. So the Hindenburg, one of the reasons why it was so large was because it was actually made for helium, but the they ended up needing to use hydrogen because the United States wasn't giving them any. So the ship was actually supposed to be using something that was not flammable, helium, but because they didn't have enough resources to get that, Germany ended up using hydrogen, which is a fatal mistake. Also, making helium was extremely expensive, so it wasn't really seen as an option. So a lot of these large ships that had hydrogen instead of helium did have catastrophic endings where people died, but 
None of them were captured on film the way the Hindenburg was, and that really is what caught the public's attention and is kind of what ended the airship era was this big media circus around it because people were, media were lined up to film the landing of the Hindenburg and obviously it didn't go well. One little fun fact I thought was interesting when I was learning about airships is that they used water to balance the ship. So like if it was like back heavy or front heavy, they had like water in the bottom and they would like release water in certain areas to balance the ship. And I just thought that was interesting. These airships also had like, they were like almost like Titanic level fancy. Like they were very expensive to travel on. The price adjusted for inflation today is $7,000 per ticket to go from Germany to America. And they had these fancy like reading rooms, writing rooms, and piano music. They had like special musical instruments made that were lightweight, like a baby grand piano that was made out of really lightweight material so it wasn't too heavy for the ship. But they they were definitely for high class people because the tickets were just so expensive. A lot of the people that were on the Hindenburg flight that actually went down were German, like high class businessmen and women. And that is partially why it's got conspiracy theory surrounding it. So after more than 30 years of passenger travel on commercial Zeppelins, in which tens and thousands of passengers flew over a million miles and on over 2,000 flights without a single injury, the era of the passenger airship came to an end in just a very few minutes. And no, I did not write that sentence. I saw that sentence from airships.net. So if you want to read more information, I'm going to list my sources as I, as I read through. But this information was from airship.net. Go to it. And so when I was talking about other airships had exploded, um, but they weren't caught on film, those were not considered passenger ships, I don't believe, because they are saying here that there's been no injuries on passenger ships. So I think those were all like military or government of some sort. The Hindenburg. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the Hindenburg in general. So it's often the two disasters of the Titanic and the Hindenburg are often intertwined because they happen within 20 years of each other. And some people call the Hindenburg disaster the Titanic of the sky. And it's because the Titanic happened in 1912 to like luxurious aristocratic people crossing over to America on a luxury ship. And then almost 20 years later, an airship of high class people also goes down. So it, they do seem really similar. So if you ever hear the Titanic of this guys, it's probably talking about the Hindenburg. So the Hindenburg provided flights back and forth from Europe to North and South America. It traveled to New Jersey and Brazil from Frankfurt, I believe. And um, it, ha it provided like luxurious travel and half the speed of ocean liners. And it had luxurious dining rooms, cigar rooms, which is extremely shocking that they had cigar rooms considering that it was filled with a flammable gas. But... They had like regulations around who was allowed to light things. Passengers couldn't light things for themselves. They had a crew member light their cigarettes for them. It just seems odd. But apparently it happened. And I think that they couldn't really tell these fancy rich people that they couldn't smoke. So they felt like they had to provide that. <laughs> so the Hindenburg was also the last passenger f aircraft of the first airline ever so that's a little bit confusing but it was the first airline ever's last aircraft does that make sense i hope so and she was also the first flight crew ever to have flight attendants which is crazy um and she was the fastest way across the atlantic during her day which is like glorious and amazing until it ends so let's all remember this is the 1930s and she was almost named the hitler which would have been really really a lot worse probably um but she was instead named after the person who helped hitler come to power in january 1933 whose name was paul van hindenburg so he was 
someone who helped Hitler get along. So, not a great legacy, but back then, these Zeppelins were actually used all the time in German propaganda, Nazi propaganda. In fact, the Hindenburg, this really shocked me. When I looked at pictures of the Hindenburg, it's covered in swastikas, which I didn't remember that because all you can focus on is the fiery flame. But yeah, it has swastikas on it. And back in those days, um, the Hindenburg made appearances at public events such as the 1936 Berlin Games and party rallies. So they basically blasted Nazi propaganda from the Hindenburg, like singing and stuff, um, and had like the swastika all over the Zeppelin itself. So not a great legacy, but um, yeah, I had a 74 hour German propaganda flight to help remilitarize Germany. Hmm. So the Hindenburg made 17 round trips across the Atlantic from in 1936 and in its first year of flying. So it made 17 round trips in its first year of flying. And uh, it took 10 trips to the United States and seven to Brazil, which is amazing. I really honestly thought this was like a one-off. We're gonna try a blimp today and it exploded, but this was like a pretty safe means of travel for back then, at least relatively, right? Like they. I think I would have actually felt kind of comfortable taking this. So the flight that the disaster happened on was actually the airship 63rd flight. So who else would have felt comfortable maybe going on? Because I probably would have. Now we're going to talk about the final flight, the disaster itself, and some conspiracy theories and mysteries around it. So stay tuned. There's a quick commercial. But it'll be over soon. Greetings! Thank you for watching. I just wanted to let you know I have a new way you can help contribute to the show. It's www.buymeacoffee.com slash Mama, And you can contribute as little as $5 towards your favorite cutest little favorite. And I will link it in the description below. Give me a little tip jar. Yeah. Also, while I'm at it, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and comment. And you'll have 100 years of good luck. Thank you for helping me. And now back to the show. Bye guys. The final flight. So the Hindenburg began its final flight on May 3rd, 1937, carrying 36 passengers and 61 officers, crew members, and trainees, which means there's like three times the amount of crew members as there were passengers. I just thought that was interesting. The ship left Frankfurt at 7 16 p.m. and flew over Cologne and then crossed a bunch of like English Channel stuff. Not really that important. It's just a normal flight for them. And then the Hindenburg goes across the Atlantic and eventually ends up back to its final destination, which is supposed to be Lakehurst, New Jersey. And at this point, the flight is running really far behind. It's 12 hours behind supposed to land at 6 a.m. but because of weather they get really delayed and this is kind of I think one of the contributing factors to what causes the accident. So the return flight back to Germany the passengers were supposed to board at sometime that afternoon and a lot of the passengers that were waiting to go back to Germany wanted to watch King Louis or King George the sixth I think be um, crowned and so there are a lot of fancy pants passengers waiting to go back to Europe but there's storms in New Jersey and it really wasn't safe to fly so the captain of the Hindenburg decides to take the current passengers on like a little bit of a tour of Manhattan and just like try to pass some time um, but the crew feels very pressured to land the ship so that they can get these fancy pants people off to the crowning of a king. Oh my god, like how important. So there's two people that we're gonna try to keep in my memories for the next part of this story, and that is Captain Max Bruce, who was the Hindenburg's commander, 
And then we were also going to need to remember the Lakehurst Commanding Officer, which is the name of the air station, the Naval Air Station, which was Charles Rosendahl. And he is the person that's helping the Hindenburg land. So around 6 p.m., Rosendahl sent a message to Proust saying that the temperature, pressure, visibility, and winds are now considered suitable for landing. So he basically gives them the okay that they can go ahead and land the airship, which is landed in a super strange way. I'll explain how they <laughs> land airships because it's very interesting. They basically just like throw down a bunch of ropes and then like 200 men at the bottom have to hold on to the ropes and slow down the airship. It just seems like a crazy mechanism, but I guess how else are you going to stop a blimp from flying? Um, so at 622, uh, Rosendahl radioed Proust recommending landing now. And at 708, they said they recommend the earliest possible landing. So they're giving the all clear. So at 625, the first visible external flames appear. And most witnesses say they saw flames at the top of the airship. And the entire thing is engulfed in flames in 34 seconds, I believe. So this all happens so quickly. I don't rely on anyone's memory to really recall how the flame started and how it spread because it would just be so hard to track in that short of a time. But all within that one minute, the entire airship is engulfed in flames. Um, survival was just a matter of whether or not you got blasted out basically because they were close enough to the ground that if you did get blasted out you were possibly going to survive not that many people died from jumping it was mostly the people that were on the interior of this ship that died from the flames um and luckily because they were landing a lot of people were near the windows looking down so the people that were near the windows looking down got blasted out and actually mostly survived. It was the people who were in the center um, that were more so doing, I guess, the work or just not looking at the windows that actually did die in this disaster. And additionally, one member of the ground crew that was um, holding the ship down also perished when the ship landed on him. And keep in mind, there's media everywhere, and this is actually where the famous phrase, oh, the humanity, comes from, because there was a journalist named Hubert Morrison that was broadcasting live, and I'll read you an exact quote. He was broadcasting live for a local radio network, and he says, oh, it's burst into flames, it's on fire, it's catching, crashing, terrible, oh my, get out of the way, please, it's burning, bursting into flames and falling onto its mooring mass. All the folks agree that this is terrible. What a weird, kind of like, oh, everyone agrees. Well, at least there's that. Um, this is the worst of the worst catastrophes in the world, which I'm sure to him it was. There's smoke, there's flames, and there's and the frames crashed into the ground, not quite to the mooring mast. Oh, the humanity, which is the big fancy quote that came from this. Um, all the passengers screaming around here, which must have been just horrifying to listen to on the radio because before then they're talking about the glory and the majesty and the glinting gold of the ship. And then suddenly it's just like, ah, and that must have been terrifying. So of the 97 people that were on board, 62 of them managed to escape with their lives. Not all of them escaped unscathed. Uh, most of them were burned. But at least from the pictures, you just assume nobody survived this and that it's like a, one of those situations where everyone on board died instantly. So it was completely shocking for me to see that 62 of the 97 people survived. It's just remarkable, honestly, that anyone survived this. Um, I always just assumed my whole life that everyone died. So I guess that's the good news that I've learned from this. So the official findings during the investigation found that there was a hydrogen leak somewhere and some sort of spark that was either caused by like a rope breaking or like friction or some people even blamed the skin of the Hindenburg was made out of some special material that people hypothesized was flammable as well 
Um, but no one ever really saw the spark. So that is where the mystery lies in that no one really knows how this flight that had a perfect safety record exploded and um, there was no real evidence left to investigate it. So the official finding is that it was just some sort of hydrogen leak that got um, exposed to a spark and caused this big giant explosion. But now we're going to talk about the theories and some of the conspiracy theories around it. Conspiracy theories. So because the airship had deep ties to the Nazi party and in fact was touting swastikas, a lot of people saw it as an emblem of the Nazi party. In fact, it was used at the 1936 Olympic Games. And so immediately Germany's first assumption was that it was some sort of sabotage, especially considering that it was landing at a naval, American naval station, that they, they just assumed that likely it was some sort of attack. And in fact, someone had called in, or did they have telephones back then? Someone had put a threat out on the Hindenburg for this particular flight, and there happened to be agents on that flight to make sure nothing bad happened. And in fact, there are a few suspicious characters that a lot of people think may have been involved. Another reason why people thought that this might be an attack on the Nazi party was because the airship had really been dominated by Germans and so bringing down an airship would kind of be a metaphor for bringing down Germany. And also the Germans pride themselves on technological and engineering advancements and excellence and they thought this might just be like a F you to Germany on that front. All this information on the conspiracies surrounding the Hindenburg I got from the unredacted.com so visit their website if you want to read where I found this information but thank you the unredacted. Um, so one piece of evidence that was given as like why this was sabotage was because the Hindenburg had a perfect safety record before this and then suddenly there's all this media and um, they're in America and this war is kind of like steaming in the background and one crashes in like this very dramatic fashion right when they're in front of all the cameras. So I can see that. Um, there were 22 photographers and cameramen at Lakehurst when it exploded and yet none of them saw the spark of electricity that was said to have caused the explosion. Many people say that the explosion was caused by that storm that like delayed the airship's landing. People say that it was like a strike of lightning from that, but no one saw it. But it's a part of the official finding was that some sort of spike happened and they theorized it could have been electricity. Um, many who were involved in the ship, including the ship's captain, never believed this theory about the thunderstorms or like some sort of spark happening. Hydrogen on its own when sealed away is not flammable so there would have had to have been some sort of leak and in order for the leak to happen some sort of some sort of like tear or something would have happened to the Hindenburg so they're suspecting some sabotage happened there. Um, Zeppelins have been used for decades without incident and the company had an impeccable safety record. Not a single passenger on any Zeppelin airships had ever been killed or even injured in nearly 30 years of operation, which is like, I feel like better than modern day. Um, Hindenburg's predecessor, the Graf, had logged more than a million miles, traveled around the world and crossed the Atlantic 144 times, all without incident. The Germans also found it suspicious that the FBI was investigating this considering that if it was just an accident that the FBI wouldn't need to be involved and so they took that as sort of a sign that maybe there was some sort of terrorism happening and the focus of the investigation centered around two people. One was named Joseph Spach. So Joseph Spach had been freaking people out especially like the crew members um, who were on high alert because of the threats on the Hindenburg. Um, 
People felt like he was acting oddly and he was aloof and did not mix with the other passengers. Keep in mind they're there for two days. I also probably would have been acting suspicious just because I wouldn't want to talk to everyone. Um, he, but he was heard expressing anti-Nazi sentiments and also um, his dislike of airships, which is like, but you're on one, sir. Um, he also had an opportunity to be by himself and um, plant a bomb potentially because he had two dogs leashed up in a restricted area where the explosion was sought to have originated. And um, he would go off and visit the dogs when he wasn't supposed to. And he, whenever people would catch him in these um, restricted areas, he would just say something about the dogs. He made like weird jokes about the dogs being dangerous. He just like overall and also wait I just thought of this if you were gonna like plant a bomb and you were evil and you didn't care about dogs maybe you'd want dogs there so that people didn't like go into the room where you planted it maybe um so it was against the rules for him to be in the areas that he was and people felt like he could have sabotaged the ship during one of these covert visits just a random note is that spa was a acrobat, so it was deemed likely that he'd be able to creep and crawl and get up to the spaces where it might be necessary for him to get up into to explode the airship. So his occupation as an acrobat was seen as a likely cause that maybe he would be able to pull this off. I'm not so sure about that. So the second person that was considered suspicious was a man named Eric Spach, and he, sorry, we're just gonna call him Eric because the other guy's name is kind of similar. And um, he was considered suspicious because there was some small dry battery found in the wreckage by the New York bomb, spot, bomb squad, and it was considered something that could have been used as an incendiary device, um, which led to the crew member Eric Spach um, coming under suspicion. And he was known as kind of an amateur photographer type that might have had access to this. Um, so I, some witnesses say they heard like a camera flash kind of sound before the explosion happened. But to me, it just seems like people trying to put pieces of the puzzle together that probably aren't there. And this poor man that had batteries maybe got pinned for a little bit. He was also considered one of the only crew members to have access to the area where the ship was, the explosion started. So digging into his background also revealed a possible motive, which seems just like reverse engineering, like you're, you're really looking dependent on this man. Um, uh, his girlfriend back in Germany was thought to have communist sympathies and may have been interrogated, interrogated for anti-Nazi radicalism. Um, so some people believe that he was intending to kill the not kill any passengers but the Hindenburg himself and that the ship being 12 hours late he was unable to retrieve the device before it was going off when the ship landed so that kind of plays the delay of the flight plays into both of these people's alibis I guess they were intending to be not alibis but their motives in both cases the police and the investigators believe that they weren't intending to kill themselves when they're in the ship they thought that the ship would have landed and that there would have been some sort of timer involved. So in both circumstances, there wasn't enough evidence and not enough motive to charge either of these people. And Eric's, Eric died, Eric Spach, the last one. He died and was an, unable to defend himself. And the first guy, Joseph, he survived the disaster was deeply upset by the rumors, which would be deeply upsetting. And in 2013, there are some scenarios run by some fancy university that tried to recreate the disaster and see what really happened. People believe basically it's still the same thing that some sort of mysterious spark happened and some sort of mysterious leak happened simultaneously at the same exact time during a bunch of times where there was a camera crew around to film it. Just seems a little bit suspicious to me. I don't know about you. I don't really know if either of these two are involved, but it is a little bit weird that this spark mixed with this hydrogen leak happened in this like perfectly, not perfect, but this like very 
skeptical -y way. So that is the Hindenburg disaster. And I think that's it. Let me know if you have any questions or if you have any thoughts about things you want me to cover further on this topic. <laughs> Thank you guys for watching and we're going to continue doing these Hachimama conspiracy and mystery type videos and we're also going to start, we, I'm one person, it's just me, um, I'm also going to start recording more of my Home with Hachimama channel. It's going to be like health, wellness, the Enneagram, that type of stuff. So if you are interested in health and wellness and personality type things, that's going to be at Home with Haji Mama, and I'm gonna put that channel linked in the description below. Let me know if you have any topic suggestions for either type of video, the mystery conspiracy or the um, home and health and wellness channel. And I love you guys, and thank you for watching.